Uh, I am Cynthia Murphy, head of research for the ETF Think Tank. Uh, always, you know, writing, talking, and, and reading about all things ETFs. Um, I'll let my, the rest of my team introduce themselves, and then we'll we'll pass it to Michael, who can who can tell us about his experience and um, what makes him special. Why we have him here today? So, Dan, go next. Sure, uh, Dan Weiskopf here, ETF professor, also lead ETF strategist for the ETF Think Tank. And um, also co-portfolio manager of Block, the blockchain fund. How's it going, everyone? David Chikansky, our fellow portfolio manager within the Tidal Financial Group, um, working on two of our ETFs as well as our internal SMAs. Very excited to learn more about capital flows from Michael Howe. Michael, if you could please introduce yourself to the group. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, Mike Howell here. Um, I'm... Uh... CEO of a company called Cross Border Capital. Uh, we're a, an advisory firm based out of London. Um, uh, that basically does research, uh, research work, and runs money. We've got a money management side that uh, does a lot of fixed income investment. Um, my background's been uh, been at Cross Border, which I founded about twenty five years ago, I guess. So that's quite a long stretch. Uh, prior to that, I was head of research at a, a British company called Bearings. Uh, which you may have uh, may recall uh, had a celebrated bust about 1995. Uh, Bearings was very big in the emerging market space. It was sort of the pioneer uh, in many cases in the in those markets uh, going back to the late 1980s. Uh, I actually joined Bearings from Salomon Brothers. I was research director of Salomon Brothers uh, for about seven eight years, uh, and uh, probably some people who got long memories may remember the Salomon Brothers had a similar upset. So. Uh, you know, the great adage in uh, financial markets is never bother climbing the ladder because the ceiling always comes down to meet you. So November was the best market for bonds since 1985, right? The Barclays Ag had its highest return in whatever, that 35, 38 year period. Right. Um, what did you do to celebrate the greatest bond months <laughs> in the last 35 years? Uh, well, I think no. the, yeah, I think the answer is... Uh, start taking positions off the table again. I think that yeah. I think the bond outlook is uh, challenging to say the least. Uh, I think there's opportunity at the front end of the curve. Uh, I'm not too sure about the uh, the back end. Uh, I think the treasurer, if I was in the treasurer, I'd be pretty nervous about the back end. I think we saw, we've already seen a, uh, let's say a failed auction or a not particularly impressive auction. And there's a lot more going to come. Uh, I think Janet uh, is doing actually a wonderful job at massaging the markets right now. I just wonder how long she can keep it going. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be pressing the case for uh, treasuries, long dated treasuries right now. I think they may be OK, but I think there's a lot of other opportunities in fixed income, uh, apart from looking at uh, long dated debt. Yeah, the signal of choice in treasury world seems to be the uh, issuance spread day, like what the uh, the spreads are in issuance um, for these really big, massive treasury issuance days we're seeing, as you've alluded to in a lot of the material you produced of who is actually buying this debt. So how much are you using signals like that where you're looking at actual like spreads on the issuance days and treasuries and you're putting together your thesis and your portfolios? Well, I think that's a, that's got to be a factor in terms of looking at it. But I think we, you know, we've got to try and take a longer term view about what's driving the markets. And I think what you've got is uh, you've got sort of two two dynamics going on. Uh, one is there's uh, there's a lot of pressure on the back end of the curve from coupon issuance. I mean that's got to step up hugely in coming years. I think the you know the uh, the, the fact is that the deficit is blowing out. Uh, this is not just a U.S. problem. I mean I think it's uh, you know I don't want to suggest I'm hitting on the U.S. here because the U.S. is probably the cleanest shirt in the laundry right now. But there's an awful lot of dirty dirty washing out there in other countries. And the trouble is that demographics, as we know, are aging pretty fast. And you know you've got mandatory spending claims on governments. Social Security, Medicare, such like. I mean, the defense bill is going up astronomically. Uh, these things are going to be paid for. Um, the great fact is that you just look around the world and popularism is on the rise. And therefore, who is going to vote for tax increases? Nobody. So plain fact is, and we saw that brilliantly through the COVID, brilliant example in the COVID crisis, what do governments do? They turn immediately to uh, raising debt and ultimately printing money. And so, you know, what we've got is uh, ultimately uh, money printing. The money, the money printing machine is going to start going buzz quite furiously. 
And therefore, what investors have got to start seriously thinking about are monetary inflation hedges. And that comes down to principally two assets, gold and Bitcoin. And it's as straightforward as that. So, so um, today we had some news from Mo from Moody's, and it reminded me about how maybe irrelevant the credit rating agencies are, um, or maybe they are relevant. What's your view in terms of the credit rating agencies, um, and frankly, the action that they took on China today? Well, I think the thing is, I've I've lived through uh, many many cycles, Dan, and I've got to say, I think that the credit rating agencies play a role, but generally they're pretty irrelevant. I mean, they've 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 stuffed up so many times that I think it's you know their 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 reputation is uh, somewhat questionable. I mean, I think the whole point about China is, I mean, in my view, is nonsensical. Uh, I mean, is does China deserve? I mean, probably China doesn't deserve a credit rating anyway, but it certainly doesn't de deserve to be downgraded. Uh, the fact is, this is state debt or quasi-state debt. Uh, most of the uh, the question marks are over yuan-denominated uh, debt in companies, and you know the Chinese have got a printing press as as uh, you know as good as the uh, European or the US one. So let's not worry about that. I mean, w will they will they create a Lehman moment? No, they won't. Uh, I think they're that they're that crazy. There'll be a bailout of some form. Uh, the Chinese state has got huge access to assets if it needs it. Uh, it'll basically use them. I mean, the I'm not suggesting in any shape of at all that the Chinese economy is uh, is wonderfully positioned, but I don't think this is a, a threat at all. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the end. Yeah, well, I think what you know, you come back to looking at the Chinese question, and you know, we've got to remember here that China took a very different response to the COVID crisis that Europe and the US did, and in the case of Europe and the US, in the what in the face of a supply side crisis, what did policymakers do? They eased policy. They basically created demand. So what you're going to get is a stabilization of GDP, but actually ultimately much higher inflation. And what did we get? Exactly that. What did the Chinese do? They they tightened policy. So what you get in that situation, you're bound to get some sort of recession or slower growth and probably um, a weaker weaker price behavior. And that's exactly what the Chinese have had. And what you're getting now is a, a normalization of those trends. So inflation in the West is coming down. It's really a, largely a supply side, supply side effect. And what's happening in China, you're getting broadly the economy beginning to sort of stutter forward, but it's, it's getting traction. And the amount of money the Chinese are throwing at the economy suggests to us 2024 is actually going to be a pretty good year. And you start looking around at commodity markets and you think, well, look, hey, why is the iron ore price up sort of 30% or so? Uh, you know, something's going on here. And China is a big consumer. It's helped the Brazilian economy out in that in that channel. So I would have thought looking into next year, you've got to start banking on some form of recovery in the Chinese economy, which may change things entirely. But that whole process is really saying, look, we're in a world now where inflationary pressures are beginning to sort of start to muscle forward. It may be, you know, in the very short term, the inflation prints come in much lower than Maybe economists have been have been expecting. I mean, that's that's been the recent experience. But hey, out there, there's an inflation bogey we've got to we've got to face, and it's yeah. either monetary inflation or Chinese costs. It's it's always been in the last like nine or twelve months or so. Our expectation that inflation is unlikely to actually hit that two percent. It's just going to kind of teeter totter, maybe a little bit below, a little bit above. But the likelihood of like a ship that's going like this just smooth sailing is just very, very unlikely. It's going to happen in oscillations. What do you make of President Xi's uh, recent trip to the U.S.? Because that's something that kind of hasn't happened in a long time, and I think it's somewhat telling to where they are from a financial perspective. How do you factor that into U.S.-Chinese relations and what it might mean to Chinese markets for 2024? Well, I think the, you know, the, the reality is that you know, neither the, U the U.S. can't live without China and China can't live without the U.S. I mean, there's a relationship that you need and that, that's got to be forged sensibly. And I think that if you go back to uh, the problems, the problems basically emerged in 2001 with the entry of China into WTO. The Chinese basically, I mean, in a word, were cheating furiously. People ignored that for a long time. They started to realize uh, the, you know, the liberties maybe China was taking. And then what's happened is that, uh, you know, the U.S. authorities have come down on China pretty heavily in the last two or three years. Um, you know, that's 
that's obviously something that needs to be re retested or re-examined. But I mean, ultimately, uh, I would have thought you'll, you've got to expect in the next two or three years, I mean, you know, Pache, whether it's Biden or Trump, uh, you know, at the elections next year, you've got to have some sort of uh, uh, of agreement, uh, an improvement in bilateral relations. And I think that's pretty inevitable as far as I can see. It's the, the two countries are too important to stand off. I mean, they're far too integrated. The world economy can't decouple in the way that people are suggesting. You know, um, I, I hate to ask a very naive question, but I'm always, and this isn't about a conspiracy theory, but I'm always wondering how the central banks try and coordinate their actions, or do you feel like they don't? Because as an expert around liquidity, it's all coming from the central banks, right? But Correct. The, the, their agendas are not the same, right? But let's be honest about that, right? Well, I think that's I think that that's probably true, but I think the, the, what you've got to then drill down into is what what is driving uh, this process. I mean, you know, my view, uh, which has been sort of forged over, uh, let's say, ma many years of working in uh, in the markets, is that global liquidity, watching global liquidity, is the most important thing to understand. I mean, I learned that pretty quickly when I was at Salomon Brothers. Uh, I mean, that was how Salomon. If people don't know, that's how Salomon Brothers basically made their money. They looked at global flows. They tried to understand where money was moving. The whole notion about having uh, a massive trading floor with products all over the place, so equities, bonds, uh, you know, derivatives, all represented on the same trading floor, basically said, look, there's no unrelated event in finance. If you're getting you know, your bond traders screaming on one corner, it's got implications for equities on another sphere, you know, uh, another part of the floor. So you've got to understand that money moves and trying to identify those money flows are pretty critical. And that was how Salomon put together its proprietary trading operations, trying to understand where the money was flowing. And it's from that point that, uh, you know, I decided that this was a great research area to understand. Uh, Henry Kaufman, a sort of name from the past, who was a sort of doyen of uh, US flow of funds accounting back in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, Henry was really the pioneer of that. He was uh, head of research at Salomon Brothers. Uh, he was looking at a very US-centric world by the mid-1980s when you had financial deregulation, uh, relaxation of capital controls. The world was becoming global very quickly. And my view very simply was, Zola, okay, let's just join the dots internationally. Let's look at this picture around the world. Now, if you drill into that uh, that story, what you find is that there are basically two or three really important central banks. Uh, in the 1980s, it was the Fed and the Bank of Japan. Somewhere in that story, uh, the Bundesbank played a role towards the end of the 1980s. Uh, today, what's really important is the Fed, again, still there, clearly dominant, and the People's Bank of China. And I think if you want a very, very crude, and this is a very crude assessment of what impact they make, uh, the Chinese influence the world economy they're much uh, they have a much much bigger uh, impact on industrial prices and the temper of the world economy the fed is much much more important for financial markets and if you want a really really simple view take it this way china the pboc controls or influences the iron oil price the federal reserve influences the gold price and you can think about it that's a very simple view but that's pretty much how the world works and so we get our uh, we get our steer by understanding in particular what those two central banks are doing. You've got to understand the People's Bank of China and what it's doing. There are a few PBOC watchers out there. There's got to be a lot more because it's such an important uh, player in the world. Uh, Eurozone does it matter? Well, it clearly matters, but it's pretty much in awe of the Fed. I mean, it's it's not going to deviate radically from what the Federal Reserve is doing. Bank of England, well, I mean, that's just you know a sideline now. It's not really important at all. Bank of Japan. To a large extent, is uh, in the in the sway of the Fed. It's doing pretty much, I would say, more or less what uh, maybe you know is is necessary to control the yen dollar or whatever. It's it's doing you know it's doing its calling. But broadly speaking, uh, it comes down to the PBOC and the Fed, and that's what matters. Now, what's happening right now? I mean, our view has been that you've got two things going on. One is that it's very clear that the PBOC in China is easing monetary policy quite aggressively. It wants to. Uh, get the Chinese economy revived. It's doing that at all costs. The size of the liquidity injections that China is injecting are, you know, eye-wateringly large. They've put in about four and a half trillion uh, yuan since June. 
that's just over what is close to 600 billion US. So it's sizable amounts of cash they've pushed into their markets. On top of that, they're directing the state banks to increase their lending. Uh, they're trying to arrange support for infrastructure funds or whatever it may be as well. So what you can see is a general uh, a general emphasis in the Chinese in China to get the industrial economy revived again. They need that, of course. Uh, if you look at what's going on in the U.S., uh, I mean, this is sort of a counterintuitive point because the headlines still read about QT. Well, the reality is that the Fed's balance sheet is shrinking, but hey, Fed liquidity injections are going up, not down. And the reality that's the reality. And if you want the cross check, look at bank reserves. Why aren't bank reserves going down if the Fed is taking so much money out of the system? Uh, plainly, they're not taking money out. They're putting money in. Bank reserves are edging up. Uh, there's a problem in the US with the regional banks. Uh, what the regional banks need desperately is more liquidity. They want, an, they want a steeper yield curve. Uh, I'm sure the Fed is going to do that, engineer that next year or by next year. Uh, to have a regional bank failure or a problem during an election year would be a disaster. So that's not going to happen. Uh, and I would suggest that what you've got now is, well, I mean, we've said uh, for many months now that the global liquidity cycle bottomed uh, last October. Uh, investors have got a headwind. Uh, they've they've lost the headwind. They've got a tailwind behind them. Uh, asset markets, risk asset markets are consequently having uh, a pretty decent year. And if you look at all the likely candidates for performance, uh, you can tick pretty much every box. Uh, tech is up strongly. That's what you'd expect early cycle. Um, credit markets are performing pretty well. It's what you'd expect. Uh, yield curve is beginning now to to flatten out and steepen again or trying to steepen. That's what you'd expect about this, this stage of the cycle. Uh, cyclicals are significantly outperforming defensive stocks. That's what you're starting to, you know, you're getting that. You've had that for many months now. And what you're starting to see as well is commodity markets starting to get a bid. And of course, gold and crypto are outperforming significantly. All these are barometers of more liquidity. So, so when you look at Japan specifically, um, where do you see the dollar? You know, how do you play Japan long or short the dollar? Well, I I would say that uh, I think you've got to you've got to step back and maybe uh, uh, let, let let me sort of try and give you my view on this, which is probably a a left field view, and I'm not going to say it's anyway in in consensus. My view is that uh, the yen has played the role of a stalking horse over the last two years. Um, and I say that from the simple reason that if you look at the collapse of the yen in 2022, in all my years in financial markets, I've never seen a major cross fall as quickly and as deliberately as that. Uh, markets never do that to currencies. Only governments do that to govern to currencies. So this seemed to me there was a deliberate move to push the yen much lower. And what they were trying to do was to unsettle the Chinese yuan. Uh, the Chinese were trying to fix the yuan uh, at uh, you know around seven or below seven against the U.S. dollar. Uh, they were frantically trying to keep it there. Uh, the PBOC was forced to tighten aggressively. Uh, that was a period when the Chinese economy was suffering from the COVID lockdowns. That was the worst possible time for the economy to tighten policy, but they did it. And what you've seen is a significant economic fallout in the Chinese economy uh, through the year. They decided as the yen collapsed and as the Korean won followed uh, to basically give up on supporting the yuan and they let it trade through seven uh, late in 22. Uh, what you've basically seen uh, through this year is uh, more willingness to allow the yuan to weaken when it does. And they've been able, as a result of that, to add a lot of liquidity to their markets, inject liquidity through the PBOC from mid-year. So I think that the policy of the Chinese is now to say we're prepared to allow the yuan to devalue if necessary. Uh, the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Japanese yen was a stalking horse. The Japanese got the yen down to 150 for pressure on the Chinese. What's happening now, I would suggest that probably we're going to stick around these levels. The odds are that you may well have a stronger yen. So I think that it's possible on a short term view that the yen may rally against the dollar. The reason I say that is that the one thing that you're starting to see in Japan that doesn't seem to have had a lot of commentary is that Japan has got an inflation problem. Uh, it's got an, a serious inflation problem. If you start to look at latest inflation data out of Japan, in fact, last month, because I think we're about a day away from the uh, from the November release. But if you look at the October figures, uh, what you'll see in that is a really, really mixed picture. Uh, something like two thirds or 60%, some 
of the Japanese CPI basket is expanding at a three-month annualized clip of about uh, 11%, right? And the rest of the index is falling. Now, the bit that's falling is largely government-administered prices. If you start to look at the U, and, and by the way, the headline figure in Japan is pretty much similar on a three-month annualized basis to the US, so circa four over that three-month period. Look at the US equivalent basket, and what you find is that the US is pretty much homogeneous. Most prices are growing at about four. Japan's got this big, big differential. That is a dangerous recipe because it means that those prices are embedded in the private sector. It's starting to fuel wage increases. And what we're sitting on is a powder keg because 50% of Japanese savings, household savings, are in cash or bank deposits. Now, that's a brilliant strategy if you've got deflation. It's a completely crazy strategy if you've got inflation. So there could be some big asset allocation shifts going on in Japan, and they'll want monetary hedges. They may be going back into the stock market, or they may be deciding they want to buy gold or Bitcoin or whatever it may be. So if you want to uh, you know, set up an ETF, start thinking about encouraging the Japanese to buy um, uh, some sort of monetary hedge, because that's going to be popular. And that could disrupt global fixed income markets. Because if they start to pull money seriously back out of the US, and by the way, people have spoken about this trend for a long time, but the capital flows of telling you it hasn't started yet. So they, they called it the Widowmaker, and May is that the Widowmaker trade? Well, the Widowmaker trade is basically trying to short the JGB. Yeah, I mean that people were trying to short that all the way down, uh, but you know. Uh, but how is it that this can be so uh, such a big event and nobody's talking about it? I mean, your numbers on the Japanese inflation were eye-opening. And uh, if it's such a pivotal uh, possibility for global liquidity and markets, how is it that we're just not paying that much close attention to it? Well, I don't know. It beats me. I can't answer that one. So I, I, I don't know. But I mean, the question is, you know, do, everyone's got to do their own homework. I mean, just just take a look at it. I mean, you know, that's what I did. Just thought out of interest, let's see why Japanese wage inflation is picking up um, and look at the inflate, the CPI basket. Um, and this is the problem. But, you know, let, let's be you know reasonable here. Look, Japan imports a lot of its food. It imports a lot of raw materials. How much has the yen fallen? Fallen a lot. I mean, you've got to have a lot of imported price inflation coming into Japan. Um, you know, arithmetically, I mean, you know, that's what should happen. It looks like it is. So that's that's the problem they've got. So you know, at some stage they're gonna they're gonna have to lift interest rates at the front end of the curve, um, and that will inevitably cause disruptions in bond markets. Now, I think the you know the the problematic statement that people keep throwing at this is Japan is ending yield curve control. I think that's wrong. Japan is starting yield curve control, as is every other major country worldwide. They have to do yield curve control. This is the only way out. OK, the math doesn't work otherwise. Um, and this is this is the fact where everyone's got to recognize that unless you can enact tax increases and somehow cut back on spending, somehow uh, you've got to have to control yields because the, the numbers don't add up. And if you start to I mean, look at the at the maths in the US, I mean, this is this is, again, the issue. Um, I think I'm running the saying that 10 years ago, 50 uh, percent of the Treasury market was owned by foreigners. OK. What is it now? It's a base, a short 30%. It's going lower. Uh, the Chinese are not going to be buying huge amounts of treasuries. They'll be buying treasuries, that's for sure. There's not many other places they can find an investable asset, but they're not going to be doing it in the size they were doing it before. The Japanese may not be doing that because they want to put money into their own market. So these are these are problematic. These are the problem areas. And unfortunately, Britain is just too small now to buy very many treasuries. So what you've got is a situation where you've got to go back to the domestic private sector to buy, uh, okay, well, I mean, I'll come quietly and say maybe there's appetite uh, among the pension funds for treasury debt. Uh, you know, a lot of these funds want duration. Uh, pension funds are reaching maturity, et cetera. But, you know, they, they they may need to lock in fixed income, but the amounts that are being offered or will be offered are going to be eye-watering. I mean, you just, you just think about what Janet's done in the last six months uh, or in... Actually, even coming into the next quarter, I think I'm right in saying that over 70% of funding uh, for the deficit in Q1 next year is Treasury bills, yep. not coupons. Uh, and this has got to, you know, if the Treasury is running this normal benchmark of 80 20, 80% um, coupon, 20% bills, there's, there's a lot of catching up to do here. 
uh, of having to reverse that 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 bill finance. Well, it's the kicking the can down the road and hoping it becomes a smaller problem in the future. Yeah, basically, you're you're saying we're hoping we the J- Japanification of the U.S. speeds up so someone buys our debt. I'm actually yeah. hopeful that any amount of positive yield curve would be met with heavy buying from the boomer generation in the U.S. just locking in their financial security. Um, one last question, going back on China, what are their what is their ultimate goal, and what does this boom look like in 2024? Is it further devaluation of the currency to the point that their labor is actually competitive with Malaysia and Brazil and Thailand, which would take a lot? Or is it more of like the 2010s in the U.S. of the tech market rallying in a disinflationary world where, you know, there's an aging population and and the tech services and and increase in productivity is where the gains are met? Is it the Super 7 of China is, is... the trade for next year, or where do you see it in China for 2024? Well, I think the I mean the answer is that the Chinese real exchange rate's got to go down. I mean, there's I think there's no question about that. I, I wrote a book a few years ago, which was actually called Capital Wars, so it's the same name as the Substack we've got. And basically, what that was saying is that if you look at the adjustment in the world economy uh, to capital flow shocks, it's a real exchange rate adjustment. So what that means technically is that if the real exchange rate adjusts. Either it's a change in the price level or it's a change in the nominal exchange rate. Now, uh, in other words, if China has seen a capital outflow or capital is not flowing into China, it's leaving China, Then, which in fact it is in spades, what you're going to see, therefore, is the real exchange rate has to go down. So either the Chinese price level has to drop, and we include in the price level asset prices, of course. So either prices have got to go down or the nominal exchange rate has got to go down. Now, what have you seen in China so far? What they've done is they've met uh, or largely met that capital outflow, that pressure by letting prices go down, asset prices, real estate prices, stock prices, and also high street prices go down and not the normal exchange rate. Now, any economy, communist or capitalist, cannot afford to do that because if you destroy your price level, you destroy your economy. So there are limits. So what they've got to do at, at some stage pretty quickly is to let the yuan devalue. And I think it has to devalue to about eight against the dollar. That's my reckoning. Um, So the answer to your question is yes, they're going to have to get their labor a lot cheaper. And if you're denied access to top quality technology because of the US ban, you're going to have to go down market into secondary, second line product. And we know that the Chinese are desperate for high quality uh, microchips. Uh, They haven't got those. So all they can do is to go to, you know, poorer quality equipment and that means price competitive price competition so so going back to some of your your original comments um uh i have to bring it up about bitcoin um but more inclined to ask about gold um you know what's your view on gold under under the scenario um that you're describing because i would i would think it would be very bullish extremely bullish yeah I mean, gold, gold, it looks like, is breaking out. Uh, now, that may not be great news for the central banks, and I'm sure they'll do all they can to keep it you know, pegged down. But I think the reality is the gold price is going up significantly. Now, we've, we've written a number of research pieces over the last few months about why gold looks so attractive, but it really comes down to two very simple facts. Number one is that um, the supply of gold is being compromised by the fact that many, many governments now uh, outside of the G7 are buying gold uh, in their forex reserves. And we put a chart out at the beginning of this year, which basically had a chart which showed the path of BRICS plus friends uh, gold reserves. So in other words, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, plus the coterie of countries that want to join the club so, you know, at one stage, it was Argentina, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Kazakhstan, you name them. All these guys uh, want to be in the club too, okay? So you add up all their gold reserves, and you find that it's been accumulating steadily at a rate of about, uh, I think it's about 400 to 500 tons every year, right, of extra gold. So it's about, what, 25% of world production every year they're taking out. 
And by September, our prediction was the end of September 2023, what you would see is the BRICS plus friends gold reserves would surpass Fort Knox for the first time ever. 8,000 tons plus. And that is significant because what it tells you is that outside of the G7, the US dollar is no longer the marginal reserve asset in the world economy. And that's significant. So that's point number one. There's an appetite for gold out there and it's increasing by other central banks, not the friendly ones, the unfriendly ones, let's say, uh, at a rate of four to 500 tons a year. And that's the steady trend. And the second point is that people want monetary hedges if you're creating monetary inflation. Now, one of the things that we keep arguing and keep pointing out is that gold is not an inflation hedge. It never has been, okay? It's a monetary inflation hedge. It's not a high street inflation hedge because high street prices can are comprised of two factors, monetary factors and cost factors. So if you get, for example, in 2024, a fall in inflation pressures because of supply side improvements, supply chains coming back into uh, action or whatever it may be, or oil prices being lower, that doesn't mean to say the gold price will fall, parry pursue with falling consumer prices, because what's driving gold is the monetary dimension, which is worrying on the background. And gold is dominated by that, not by cost, by cost factors. And monetary inflation matters for the price level in the very long term because cost factors tend to even out um, generally. It's all about monetary factors in the longer term. And over that time, over the long time, long term time horizon, gold tends to match monetary inflation. And to give you some figures, okay, since 1995, global liquidity is up five times, okay? It's now about $170 trillion, the number that we look at. This is money that's flowing through financial markets, $170 trillion. So about twice, pretty much twice world GDP or about one and three quarter times. It's up five times since 95. What's the gold price up five times? What's the consumer price level up two times in the US? So gold has matched global liquidity, monetary inflation. It has easily beaten CPI inflation because CPI inflation has been held down by massive cost uh, improvements, uh, technology or whatever, or Chinese labor or whatever you care to think of. But those are the factors that really matter. Now, if you go forward and start thinking about what's going to happen to monetary inflation, uh, our view is that this is basically, uh, basically dominated by what the Federal Reserve is going to have to do in terms of buying US government debt. Now, of course, we may be completely wrong, but our view is that the only buyer out there is, or the marginal buyer has got to be the Federal Reserve again. Uh, and actually, the Congressional Budget Office seems to agree. Because if you look at the latest Congressional Budget Office figures, they have a very nice dog leg in their expectations or projections of Fed debt buying. And what they're suggesting is that they start to resume buying quite aggressively uh, from 2025, 2026 onwards. And the balance sheet starts to expand. And we think it comes a lot earlier than that uh, because there's a lot of numbers in the CBO calculations that are way, way too conservative, particularly um, defense spending, which is very low in their estimates. Uh, but many other analysts have said, look, the Medicare numbers don't make any sense. The Social Security numbers are way, way too low. Uh, and what we know, I mean, the evidence in the US and Europe, if I'm not mistaken, is that since COVID, the number of... Uh, uh, let's say, sick or ill or workers claiming Social Security has gone up dramatically. Uh, and that means the bills are going up in all these governments, uh, you know, noticeably, which basically means uh, deficits are blowing out. So you're going to have, a, have to have a lot more debt raising going on. And the only way, I mean, well, I say the only way, but the, the path of least resistance in an economy that is dogged by popularism uh, with, you know, is it red? Does it go red? Does it go blue? We just don't know. It's at the margin. No one is going to say, I'm going to raise taxes. If Trump or Biden say, well, okay, on my uh, my, my policy is going to raise income taxes in the US by you know, five, 10 percentage points, they're going, to, they're going to lose the election. I mean, it's as plain as simple as that. Okay. Same in Europe. So no one's going to say that. They're basically going to make these promises and kick the can down the road. And so what you've got is a lot of monetary inflation potentially coming not necessarily high street inflation. It may, of course, spill over, but not necessarily. But that means gold is a brilliant hedge. Now, gold tends to move uh, typically at a slightly faster rate than global, uh, the monetary inflation, global liquidity. It's got a multiplier of about 1.2 or thereabouts. So it tends to outpace over long-term global liquidity. 
But then think about Bitcoin. Now, health warning coming because there's only been a short history for Bitcoin and there's a lot of special circumstances and it's very, very difficult to get any reasonable or sensible statistical analysis. But if you look at the data, what it shows is Bitcoin is about five times more sensitive to liquidity than gold is. So in other words, it's exponential gold. Now, that's a dangerous thought, but, you know, that's what it's doing. And if you look at what's happened this year, uh, you know, I would say that Bitcoin is a really, really good indicator of liquidity trends. Uh, it's pretty much moved within. I mean, we do we analyze this pretty closely looking at weekly uh, estimates of global liquidity. But it's basically moving about 10 to 12 weeks uh, you know, behind the movements in global liquidity. Yeah, and I, th I going back to the inflation thing in the U.S. And, and and the expansion of our balance sheet, which you're projecting to come in 2025. I think one of the frustrations a lot of us have had is fighting a supply-driven inflation cycle with interest rates and not heavier on the balance sheet, like we should have been able to reset from a much lower level and get the our, our debts much better in, in order in the last couple of years. Uh, but it does sound while you are bullish on kind of hard assets, gold, Bitcoin commodities it, it, you do seem to have a little bit of a, a dollar bull versus other currency stance um i'd love for you to speak on that a little bit further because from a u.s investor that's been one of the hardest things to get advisors to allocate to international equities is solely because of the strength of the dollar versus other currencies um and despite all of this and your strong belief in bitcoin and gold i'm still coming away thinking this John still prefers the US dollar versus many other currencies in the world. So what sure, I think that? I think bottom line, medium term, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And the the rationale is is pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, you know, one is that the, the US dollar is not going away. Um uh that's for sure. It's it's will remain the dominant currency uh for as long as US financial markets remain the dominant uh financial markets worldwide. And that's gotta be true because there are no challenges. Um, uh, everyone wants to, you know, wants to issue in dollars. Foreign governments, foreign corporations, they want to issue in dollars. This is where the depth of the market is. And therefore, the dollar is going to remain the dominant currency. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dollar goes up, of course. Uh, but I think the factors are, if you look at the challenges, uh, who are the big challenges? Asia is going to be dominated by China. And as I've said, if you look at the real exchange rate of China, it is compromised and the yuan has to devalue. And I think that's that's a reality. Is the yen going to go up against the Chinese yuan uh, over the medium term? Probably not. It will match it, I should think. Uh, uh, there may be a flurry in the yen short term, but I think it's still locked into the same orbit as the yuan. Uh, then you look at the Europeans and, you know, I mean, what can you say? I mean, first of all, you've got, uh, I mean, you've got a, a continent with no energy policy or no energy resources. Uh, they they struggle. Um, they've got aging demographics. They've got a uh, um, a European monetary system, which are, you know is just basically sellotaped together. Um, I mean it's it, I mean it's it's not it's really nonsensical. I, I just can't see how you can operate a system, a monetary system, with a currency that is almost as half baked as the euro is. Okay, it's it's survived for twenty odd years or so. Um, you know. Great, that that's a success in itself. But the fact is that if you look at any currency system, be it the US, be it even Britain, for heaven's sake, and you look at what happens in a fixed exchange rate regime, which is after all is what the Europeans have got, what happens in every every region is the rich states get richer and the poor get poorer. Just look at America, okay? What happens is that you know the 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 rich North or California, the West Coast, get richer. And the southern states get poorer. That's the reality, year after year after year. So how does the federal government solve that? It basically makes a lot of its takes a lot of its procurement, military procurement or whatever in the south. That's where all the bases are. That's where all of the armaments companies are, etc. Uh, it social security levels things up. So what you have is a more homogeneous national economy. Same in Britain. The regions basically supply government services. Uh, that's where that's where those that stuff is devolved to. And therefore, you get a more even picture. In Europe, that didn't happen. Okay, Italy gets poorer and poorer. Greece gets poorer and poorer. Uh, Germany gets richer and richer until it doesn't, and it's hit a roadblock right now. But that's the divide. And without a fiscal policy, uh, a fiscal transfer mechanism, the whole thing is going to blow apart at some stage. And what you're seeing now is the cracks coming. 
Putin realizes that and he's rattling the tree furiously or the cage furiously. So dollar goes up medium term. I think that you've got no choice. There's no choice. But gold is probably a better asset. Coming back to, to Bitcoin for, for a moment, um, I, I struggle with how people look at Bitcoin in the context of liquidity. Maybe you can help me out with this. They're, 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 the stats that I look at say something like 70% of, of the wallets that hold Bitcoin don't move Bitcoin, right? They, they're holding it. Then I also see stats that say something like 20% of Bitcoin has been lost. And yet I also see stats that something like 4 million or so Bitcoin uh, are tradable, right? I know these numbers don't really add up, but but how do you look at Bitcoin in the context of your liquidity uh, metrics? Because sometimes it feels like a, a micro cap the way it moves. Sure. No, I think it's uh, all great points. All great points, Dad. I mean, uh, I, I will struggle to answer any of those, but all I would say is that my evidence is to say, look, uh, if it's yellow and quacks, it's a duck. And what you've seen is that Bitcoin has responded pretty pretty well to the liquidity cycle. It's moved in step, and it seems to be acting like a monetary inflation hedge, and it may well continue. Now, the way that we look at this is that we say, look, okay, to analyze this more rigorously, let's basically take uh, a collective of all monetary inflation hedges and let's put precious metals alongside cryptocurrencies. Look at the capitalization of both both pools of assets and treat them as one, one general pool, call those monetary inflation hedges, and they move with liquidity pretty closely. Okay. Now, it so happens that for now, or up until now, Bitcoin has moved exactly with that pack. It's actually outperformed that pack, but it's moved in step. And therefore, it, it, is, it warrants inclusion as a monetary inflation hedge until it doesn't. And, you know, you could argue that the supply of this current, of Bitcoin is going to suddenly increase for whatever reason. Uh, there may be fraud involved. I mean, if the facts change, then as they say, we change our mind. But for the moment, it seems to be running. It's opaque, I've got to say. I, absolutely. I'm going to revert back to a question on China and their ability to regain their... Uh, stance in the world in terms of the cheap manufacturer worldwide i we have a chart in our last commentary that shows um mexico actually surpassing uh china in terms of imports to the u.s for the first time in 20 years uh these are trends that like once they have a direction unwinding a direction is like very very tough so like what does that look like again sorry i know i'm i'm, I'm so uh stuck in china here but you see we have a lot of really good information like is their economy the regeneration of the export economy from China? Well, I think in, inevitably there's 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 got to be you know uh, a move back. There's got to be some retreat from globalization. From a prudent point of view, uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of manufacturers are going to have to have different supply lines just in case uh, some something untoward happens. I mean, what happens if there is an engagement with Taiwan? I mean. I'm, I'm sure the Chinese are not that foolish. I mean, they do they try and find some other way of uh, of maybe uh, of obtaining uh, you know control over Taiwan rather than militarily. But uh, you know, even if the case they did, or they rattled a sabre uh, and there was some dislocation, corporates will have to have alternative supply lines. And I think it makes sense that countries like Mexico benefit, but that may be a one-off change. Uh, I think if you look in the longer term, China is a much much bigger economy. I mean, oh, clearly. Uh, you know, we're talking about billions of workers, not tens of millions. And uh, ultimately, the Chinese economy matters a lot and there will have to be more integration. I think that everyone would have accepted, uh, you know, a, a bigger role for China in the world economy if China hadn't decided to cheat so furiously uh, at, uh, at various things. So I think there's a there's a case for negotiation. But I think if you come back to, you know, the ultimate the ultimate question is, you know, how strong is the Chinese economy? Uh, I mean, I'm a cynic here. I mean, I spent ac in academia uh, a number of years uh, studying, uh, which probably dates me, uh, studying the, the sort of Soviet economy and the Eastern European economies. And everything I see suggests to me 
that China is not dissimilar to that. I mean, it's 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 a, it's okay. It's a much more efficient version of the Soviet Union, but it's following the same path. And ultimately, what you see in those economies is you see very high growth for a long time, for year after year after year. Uh, I mean, if you go back and look at the experience, uh, when I was looking at the Soviet Union back in the sort of the uh, in the early eighties, what was happening is the main source was the CIA fact book of the of the Soviet Union. It was the main source of economic data. And every year, the uh, annual CIA fact book had a sort of dog leg of what would happen to the Chinese economy, uh, the, the uh, Soviet economy rather. It would basically expand at very high rates until one year out, then it would suddenly collapse. And then it was always the case. That was their projection. Another strong year, then it collapsed. Another strong year, then it collapsed. That never happened until it did. And that's what's going to happen to the Chinese economy. It's going to keep growing for probably one, two decades at high rates. And then it will suddenly derail because ultimately what you can't do is to create and this is the problem the soviets had they couldn't create a consumer-based society and when they tried to do that the whole economy derailed okay and that's china's challenge it can't do that it's against the ethos of the machine they you know they they want control they won't economically enfranchise the consumer that that's alien to their thinking so ultimately what they're going to do is drive growth either by infrastructure or by exports and I think it's going to come now largely through both channels. But I think you're going to see renewed exports, which means you've got to have a weaker yuan. But the problem that we've got, and this is you know what we've tried to spell out over the years, not saying that we're in any way fans of the Chinese economy, but it's wrong to, to diss China and say it's about to have a Lehman moment or whatever. It, that won't happen. Okay, It's a different dynamic. But the problem is that even if China sees inefficient growth for two decades, it's still spending an awful lot on military. And that's the problem. If they keep spending 5% of their GDP on military, they get a bigger, bigger military presence. And that's the threat. Yeah, scary threat. Um, so I, I guess my last question, because we're at the top of the hour, I, I'm shocked we've gone this whole hour talking without even mentioning energy. And by the way, Michael, I think about this because you personally have great energy. I've enjoyed this conversation and trying to keep up with you um, is a challenge. And, but hey, what is your view on energy? Because that there's a limited supply, right? So under your scenario, I would think that energy should be bought. Well, I'm I'm upbeat on energy medium term. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's right. I think that it, you know, oil is a politically determined commodity price. Um, I think we've got to accept that. Uh, is the price now too low? Yes, it is. It's likely to increase. Um, I would say that, you know, I'd be more comfortable or let's say I'm assuming that the oil price goes back above $100 a barrel. I think that's where most of the suppliers would be comfortable. And I think even the US would be comfortable at a price at around those levels because the US is very competitive. Uh, and what I come back to is the great problem that Europe has. Uh, Europe doesn't have an energy pro policy. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of European energy, it was really, if you like, a post-imperial model. Uh, they never really unhooked from the old empire. That was true of Britain. It was true of France. Uh, Germany got spooked by what happened uh, at the time of the Suez Crisis back in the 1950s and decided, well, we're not even going to bother. We're going to uh, hook our or uh, you know pin our uh, pin our flag to the mast of Russia, and they got Soviet energy, uh, and that was a great idea until it wasn't. Uh, but the trouble is, what do they do now? They, they, you know, as they say, they're they're uh, they're somewhere without a paddle, and um, uh, that's the problem they've got. So they've got to basically rely on U.S. energy, I would suspect, or try and find new sources of energy as best they can. But it must be a real challenge to what is what has been still a relatively energy uh, energy intensive uh, economic block. Uh, without without good supply, they're really stuffed. Michael, this has been a great hour. We appreciate your insights. Uh, remind everybody who's listening how they can find out more about your research, where they can get it. Sure. Well, okay. If you if you want Substack, I like Substack. There's uh, our Substack offering is called uh, Capital Wars. Uh, that's available. That's uh, you know we we produce two or three pieces a week on uh, on uh, Substack, uh, giving data or giving views about what's happening to global liquidity. Uh, we've got a Twitter handle, which is at cross-border cap. 
and the website is uh, crossbordercapital.com. So you can have any of those. And I think, you know, the last point is that the liquidity cycle is going up. Investors have got a, you know, tailwind behind them. And that headwind disappeared about a year ago. And we've been bullish over the last 12 months. We continue to be bullish. We think the markets are getting into a, a pretty, well, a pretty good spot still. Uh, still a lot of gains to make. But, uh, you know, let's not be too skeptical. On the other hand, markets always climb a wall of worry. And if the economists are bearish, get bullish. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's a wrap, everybody. That's Thanks, right. guys. Enjoyed it. Happy holidays. Michael, that was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Stay well. Thank you.